The Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative at Duke Divinity School welcomes you to our lecture series entitled Jesus and Medicine. What does Christianity have to offer health care? My name is Warren Kinghorn. I'm a psychiatrist and also a theologian at Duke University, co-director of the Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative at Duke Divinity School, and an associate professor at Duke University School of Medicine and Duke Divinity School. I'm also a psychiatrist at the Durham VA Medical Center. But before any of that, I was a Christian entering medicine who wondered what my faith had to do with anything that I was seeing in the clinic and in the hospital. I want to start with just a bit of my story. When I entered Harvard Medical School right out of college, I was pretty passionate about my faith. But if you had asked me what difference Christianity makes to medicine, I would have given maybe three general answers. One is that Christian faith gives rise to medical missions. Another is that Christian faith affects the way that we talk to our colleagues and especially to our patients about faith. And a third would be that Christian faith informs the way that we think about bioethics, especially around issues at the beginning and end of life, like abortion, assisted suicide, and euthanasia. And indeed, all of these things are true. But I soon came to understand that Christianity had much more to offer. For me, there's a particular experience at the end of my first year when I spent two days shadowing at an alcohol detox and rehab facility in Boston. I spent some time with the men there, and I heard them talk about their struggle with alcohol. They would talk about not wanting to drink and hating themselves for drinking and yet drinking anyway. They were hoping through alcohol treatment to find a way toward freedom. Now, even as a first-year medical student, I could understand the medical literature around alcohol use disorder, its epidemiology, the way that alcohol operates in the brain and nervous system, emerging treatments. But what these men were describing didn't just sound like disease. It, it sounded a lot like sin. So I began to wonder, when these men were describing wanting not to drink and yet drinking anyway, in a way that destroyed themselves and their relationships, were they describing disease or sin or both? And what was the relationship between sin and disease anyway? I realized at that point that my background in church had not prepared me to answer those questions. I needed to know more. And so I started to look at the way that Christians over time had understood the concept of sin. And in the stacks of the Divinity School Library at Harvard, I learned of a very interesting debate among Christians in the fifth century after Christ. On one side of this debate were a group of Christians that have come to be known as Pelagians after Pelagius, a British monk at the time. On the other side was St. Augustine of Hippo, an immensely important Christian bishop and theologian and they disagreed passionately on the nature of sin. The Pelagians argued essentially that humans are born with free will and that with discipline and determination, humans can in theory live our whole lives without sinning. They didn't actually believe that anyone actually did this, but the point was that sin is a failure to exert sufficient willpower, a failure of discipline. Augustine, on the other hand, argued that although humans are born with some capacity to choose one thing rather than another, we're actually not free to go our entire lives without sinning. And it's not just because we individually fail to make good decisions. Rather, humans are born into sin. We can't live our entire lives without sinning. On the other side was St. Augustine of Hippo, an immensely important Christian bishop and theologian and they disagreed passionately on the nature of sin. The Pelagians argued essentially that humans are born with free will and that with discipline and determination, humans can, in theory, live our whole lives without sinning. Now, they didn't believe that anyone actually did this, but the point was that sin is a failure to exert sufficient willpower and discipline. Augustine, on the other hand, argued that although humans are born with some capacity to choose one thing rather than another, we actually are not free to go our entire lives without sinning. And it's not just because we individually fail to make good decisions. Rather, humans are born into sin. We cannot live our lives without sinning. And for Augustine, this was wonderful news. It meant that there were not two classes of people, those who've stayed pure through hard work and willpower, and those who failed. There's rather only one class, those who stand in need of God's grace to rescue us and to heal us. 
And from learning about this ancient debate between Augustine and the Pelagians, I realized three things. One is that I had always been more or less on the side of the Pelagians when it was Augustine's view that was understood as correct Christian teaching in the West. The second was that Pelagius' view, while it may seem to be more empowering because it emphasizes freedom of choice, was actually stigmatizing because it blamed people for failing. Augustine's view was actually much more gentle and empowering because it emphasized that we all need grace. None of us can consistently choose what is good and right for us all the time. And this in turn helped me to have more empathy for people who are caught in cycles of addiction. And third, though, I realized that Christian theology was way deeper and had much more to offer than I had previously understood or imagined. This experience turned my understanding of the relationship of Christian faith to medicine inside out. Medicine was becoming the world within which I interpreted human life and the meaning of health and illness, and Christian faith had to somehow fit into that. But I began to realize it was just the opposite. Modern biomedicine is a 100 to 150-year-old discipline that has a lot to offer, but Christian faith offers deep traditions of thought and practice spanning thousands of years. The vast world of medicine is just a speck in the larger, older, deeper world of Christian thought and practice. I began to want not to bring Christian faith into healthcare as an add-on, but rather to interpret and to understand healthcare through the lens of Christian faith. In this series of lectures, my colleagues in the Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative at Duke Divinity School will be thinking together with you about how we might understand modern healthcare through the lens of Christian faith. First, a note of introduction. A teacher and colleague of mine at Duke, Stanley Hauerweiss, has said multiple times, you can only act in the world you can see, and you can only come to see what you can say. What we see determines what we can say, and what we say determines how and what we see. On the slide here, you'll see several familiar ways of seeing. First, you see humans as collections of body parts, or humans as collections of symptoms, as in the DSM, which I use in psychiatry to categorize mental disorders. And these are all Uh, maybe helpful ways to go about modern medicine, but it can lead to particular approaches to modern medicine that may not be so helpful. One is that modern medicine can become quite individualistic. We can think of humans as just, uh, as just, just uh, isolated units. Another is that modern medicine can be very technical. We can focus on uh, medicine only as a matter of moving around body parts or, or reducing symptoms. And medicine can become commodified bought and sold to those who can pay for it. These are all ways that we're taught to see in medicine, but what might it mean to see differently? To see medicine not as collections of body parts or scales, but as human beings in relationship with each other and before God. So I want to introduce this series and to think briefly about 10 reasons that Christian faith matters for modern health care. The first reason is that Jesus was a healer. There are healing narratives throughout the Gospels. Jesus went around healing many, and the the image that you see on the slide is from the fourth century, from a catacomb in Rome of Marcellinus and Peter, depicting Jesus healing with a woman with a flow of blood in the Gospel of Mark chapter 5. Early Christians picked up on Jesus' healing ministry, as you'll hear from my colleague Brett McCarty. And a central commitment of the early Christians was to promote healing and to tend to those who were sick and ill. As a matter of fact, uh, a a famous quote from an early Roman emperor in the 300s speaking about the Christians said, the impious Galileans, meaning Christians, care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. Christians distinguished themselves in the Roman Empire by being those who would attend to those who were sick. And Jesus' healing has some things to say to us in modern health care. First of all, Jesus' healing always had three dimensions that often show up all at the same time when he healed people in the New Testament. The first was reversal of disorder and decay. And this is perhaps closest to our understanding of healing through medicine, especially when Jesus would raise people from the dead. The, 
the, the tissues of the body would come back together. Second, though, healing entailed rescue from hostile powers, from powers that kept people in captivity and liberated them. And third, healing uh, was a matter of restoration to community. People who were ostracized, who were on the outs, who were not welcome in community, were welcomed back into it as a result of Jesus' healing. And I want to know, how does that holistic approach to healing, what does that have to offer to us within modern medicine? Second, Christians invented the hospital. In his talk, Brett McCarty will describe how the hospital itself, the kind of institutions in which many of us practice, was an innovation that came out of Christian monastic communities in the fourth century. It's a great story, so stay tuned for that. But since I'm a psychiatrist, I want to tell the story about the formation of hospitals for people with mental illness. On this slide, you see a, a 19th century image of a famous episode that happened in Valencia, Spain on February 24, 1409. The, the main figure depicted in this image is a, a monk named Juan Gilberto Joffre. He lived from 1350 to 1417, and he was a, 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 a monk of the Order of Mercy. Now, Father Joffre had been asked to preach a sermon at the cathedral in Valencia on the first Sunday in Lent. But while he was on the way to the cathedral, he saw a group of people beating a man and throwing stones at a man who in our day would be considered to have severe intellectual disability. The crowd was yelling, on loco, which is pretty clear what that meant at that time and in ours. Father Geoffrey put himself between the crowd and this man. He commanded them to stop. He picked up the man, he took him to the chapter house where he'd been staying, and then he turned around and he marched to the cathedral. And he was so incensed by what he had seen that he stood up in the pulpit and told the wealthy people of Valencia, this is what happened this morning and you must make sure that this does not happen in your city. They actually took him up on that. And out of that came a new institution called the Hospital of the Holy Innocents that was one of the first, if not the first, hospital in Europe that was dedicated specifically for the care of people with mental illness. Many institutions, not just this one, have come out of Christians following Jesus' healing ministry and innovating new forms of health care. Third, though, Christian faith can help us to see the real, though distorted, theological roots of modern biomedicine. We've talked about ways that Christian faith may have given rise to modern, mental health, modern health care in a good way through, for example, the formation of hospitals. But it's also important to see how even some of the things that are problematic within modern health care also have roots within Christian theology, or I would argue in distortions of Christian theology. There's a book that came out uh, about 20 years ago by a theologian named Gerald McKinney titled To Relieve the Human Condition, Bioethics, Technology, and the Body. In his book, McKinney talks about the very influential thinker and scientist and philosopher Francis Bacon, who lived in England from 1561 to 1626. Bacon was famous in his time for his idea that knowledge is power. And he wrote a, a famous work called The New Organon, in which he said that we should call no disease incurable. And he was writing this in the early 1600s when almost no disease was curable. It's remarkable. Now, Bacon understood himself as a Christian. And McKinney, in this book, argues that he brought together two themes that were central to the Protestant Reformation, which had happened just before Bacon lived and wrote. The first affirmation that Bacon held on to was that the creation is made for use rather than only for contemplation. Nature is given to us for use. And the second was that active love of one's neighbor is to be prioritized over the life of the monastery or the monastic life of contemplation. Bacon believed that creation was given us for our use and also that it was good to use nature, to use creation, to relieve the suffering of one's neighbor. Putting those two things together, you have what McKinney calls the Baconian project after Francis Bacon, which is basically the idea that it's good to use creation, or you might say later nature, to relieve the suffering of others. Now, 
McKinney says that this kind of didn't do very much until the 20th century when all of a sudden medical science began to, to catch up and we actually began through medical technology to, to be able to, to manipulate the nature of the human body to relieve suffering and disease. And this has given rise, McKinney argues, to modern biomedicine. It's driven by this deep commitment that it's good to manipulate nature for the relief of suffering. This has given us many of our advances within modern, modern medicine. But McKinney also gives a caution. It also leads, for example, to intensive care units where people die miserable deaths because everyone is doing something to relieve some kind of, 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 of disease or illness state, and yet no one is able to ask the question, why are we doing this? So then this leads us to the next thing that Christian faith offers for health care, which is that Christian faith encourages us to ask the why and not just the how about medical technology. Nearly all of modern medicine deals with the question of how to attain particular goals and outcomes related to health once someone clarifies what those goals are. So if the goal is to prolong the body's life as long as possible, medicine can suggest how to do that. If the goal is to run faster, health science can tell us how to do that within limits. But modern medical science cannot tell us what kind of life is worth living or why we should be seeking to prolong life. It can't even tell us what health is. And I think this is why in medical training we tend to talk a lot more about disease than about health. Because what is health is a theological and a moral and not just a scientific question. Next, Christian faith reminds us that we are not machines but wayfarers. We're deeply formed in modern medicine to think about people as machines who need to be fixed. Medicine is the process of finding the right technological solution to fix what is broken. But scripture uses a very different image to understand human life. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. The word for pioneer here connotes one who goes before us, the trailblazer. The witness of Scripture is that we're not machines that need to be fixed, but rather wayfarers to be attended. We are those on a journey from God, our source and our creator, to God, our end and our goal and our joy. Always in this life, we find ourselves as travelers on the way from God to God. And in that journey, we walk alongside each other. And this is the central image that helps me to understand how to engage in the work of healthcare as a Christian. As a physician, I don't exist to satisfy clinical reminders and quality metrics, nor to feed the medical industrial complex, nor to provide consumer goods, nor even primarily to relieve suffering as important and good and holy as that is. Rather, my role is to attend wayfarers as a fellow wayfarer and to ask at every point what's needed right now for the journey. Sometimes what's needed in psychiatry is a medication or a hospitalization or a structured course of psychotherapy, but sometimes what's needed is a community or to get out of an abusive relationship or a home or stable access to food. The, the Christian question is always in the life of the wayfarer, what's needed right now for the journey. Next, as you'll hear much more from my colleague Ray Barfield, Christian faith gives us resources for engaging suffering. You can't avoid suffering in medicine. It's just present. It's going to be there. But it is extraordinarily hard to sit with suffering in a sustainable way over a long period of time. And healthcare practitioners, maybe especially physicians, have very complex ways of distancing ourselves from suffering. One, we can become technical. We can put ourselves in the role of objective technical expert. Or we can blame patients for their own illnesses. If only my patient would follow my recommendations, this wouldn't be happening. Or we can blame ourselves for our own inadequacy. Or we can simply withdraw from relationship. And none of these are helpful over time. All lead to burnout, which is a huge problem among current healthcare practitioners. But Christian faith gives us resources for sitting with suffering. 
Lament is a practice of naming suffering in the context of God's faithfulness. And I, I think as a psychiatrist over and over again about Psalm 13, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And later the psalm says, But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This is a psalm that names the reality of suffering. It invites us to to name our suffering and our suffering of our patients before God. It doesn't turn away, but it does so in the context of a God who doesn't turn away from those who suffer. Next, Christian faith teaches us the ineffaceable dignity of every human being. The Bible teaches us that we are made in the image of God. All humans are made in the image of God. And I think about this in the context of medicine. It's very easy when you're applying to medical school or to another health professional program to to speak for people to say something like, well, I love people and I love science and so I want to be a clinician. Christian faith doesn't call us just to love people or to love humanity in general. It calls on us to love this person who's in front of me at any given time, no matter who he or she is, no matter what time of day it is, no matter whether they can pay or not, no matter what they smell like or how they're treating me or whether it brings glory to me to care for them. We care for people not because of anything about them except that they are created in the image of God and loved by God. And this makes it absolutely important for Christians to think about the work of justice as something that's centrally important to Christian faith. Next, Christian faith draws us into friendship and community with God and with one another. Healthcare practitioners need community, just like our patients need community. And the Bible teaches the importance of the church, the gathered community of Christian believers. Ephesians 3.10 says that it's through the church, not through the medical school or the hospital or the university, that the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What would it mean for the church to be a site of making the wisdom of God known to the powers and principalities in healthcare and in our culture? Next, Christian faith reminds us, and if if nothing else comes through in this talk, this is the key message that I want to deliver. Christian faith reminds us that we are loved and known by God, and it grounds us in hope. Psalm 139 says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. This is the deepest truth about who we are. Not that we have gotten into a health professional training program, not that we are clinicians, not that we're well regarded by our colleagues or our patients, not that we're doing anything that brings status in this world. The deepest truth about who we are and who our patients are is that we are loved and known by God, and that is enough. And finally, Christian faith calls us from control to wonder. Much of modern medicine is a matter of gaining strategies for control, control of the body and the body's organ systems, the way the body moves and functions, control of the mind and control of unwanted experiences and behavior that the mind brings. And control is is a good thing. It's a good thing to be able to exercise agency in our bodies and in our world. And modern medicine can help with that. But as Christians, we're not called primarily to control. We're called to love and to wonder. We're called to stand in awe of the beauty and depth and complexity of God's creation. And so Christian faith calls us always to ask, In my clinical practice, am I becoming a deeper lover of God and of God's creation? If the answer is yes, if in the context of our work in healthcare, we're able to love God and to love others and ourselves more deeply, that is a blessing. Thank you. Welcome to the series and all the best to you as you move forward in your work and practice.
For reflection questions and other resources, visit tmc.divinity.duke.edu slash Jesus and Medicine.